Okay, so it's our fifth lecture. It's week three. And uh, quick announcements. Uh, one is that section today, if you're in the evening section today, it's in Econ 140. So that is uh, right there. Econ 140, Landau. So um, that's where section will be tonight. Uh, I think last week it was in a different building, just temporarily, because we we're still getting the room settled. Uh, the section tomorrow is, I think, in the same location it was before, which was STLC. So yeah, just be mindful of that. Homework two is due a week from yesterday, and so it'll we'll have a new assignment uh, three that will go out, you know, next week. Um, in terms of like our calendar and what we're doing this week, the main thing I want to teach you about here in week three is I want to talk about bigger apps that have more than one activity. So so far we've always had just one activity. We do the GUI and the layout. We set up the events, set up the widgets, and that's the app. That's it. You're just sitting kind of on one screen. Well, it gets a little more complicated, a little more interesting when you have two or more different kinds of activities in your same app that you want to jump around in between the two. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the main topic for, for this, this week of content. So let me just jump to my slides on that. Um, in order to teach you about multiple activities, I have to teach you about something called intents, which is an important Android concept. So. I'll get to that. Um, so yeah, lots of apps have more than one activity. Uh, I would say there's lots of different kinds of apps, lots of different patterns for apps, but I would say one of the most common examples that you'll see of an app with two activities would be kind of a main activity with a list of things. Like uh, if it's an email app, you'd have a list of all the emails in your inbox and you can click on them. And then if you click on an email, it opens up that item and shows you the information about it. It shows you the message itself and the, the text, the contents of that message. Or if it's like a, you know, Reddit or something, the main page is all the different links and things you could read and then when you tap on one of them it jumps to the thread of discussion about that link. So uh, I've heard it called like the main list activity and the details activity. That's kind of a one way of describing that usage pattern which is very common, right? So I mean, I guess my point is that those are different activities. You could imagine a world where like all of this code is living in the same Kotlin file and the same XML file. And I guess like you start out by showing the list, but then if you tap on something in the list, you like hide the list and then make some new stuff appear instead on the same activity. But that would actually be really ugly. And so that's not what we do. I think the code for that would really kind of get out of control. Instead, we make two activities for that. We have two different layouts, two XML files, two Kotlin files and the two of them interact with each other, okay? That's the plan. Um, and typically what happens is there's some kind of event that occurs in the first activity, which I call activity A here, like you click on something or whatever, and then in response to that event, your Kotlin code says, hey, I wanna jump to this other activity. Well, if you wanna have two activities in an app, the way you do that in Android Studio is you just uh, right click on your uh, sort of folder that has your, your code in it and you say you want a new activity. <coughs> Typically you'd say you want an empty or blank activity, that would be fine. So uh, I'll show you right now how to do that. Um, we've been writing this app the last time of uh, the vocab quiz thing where you could click on different words and they'll try to guess what the, you try to guess what the right definition is for a given word from a, a, a file. And so I have that project here. Um, we got that app to sort of the point where you could, you could read the file, you could pick a random word, you could pick five random definitions and it would show them to you. And uh, I just zipped and posted that code last Thursday in the state where you could just click and it would tell you if you got it right or wrong and then it would pick new words. And that's kind of what we have. So like verisimilitude I think is when things appear true or real. So if you click that it says you got it. But recidivism, if you say that's having plenty of space for what's needed. I think that's wrong. So if I click that, it says wrong. So that, that's kind of what the app does right now. So if you wanted this app to have multiple activities, I'm just gonna continue working on this app because I don't wanna start all over with a brand new app and take a lot of time. But like maybe a second activity you might want here would be uh, a way to add a word to the dictionary. You know, you hear about a new word that you think is really cool and you wanna add it to the app so that it'll, it'll add that to the rotation of things it might quiz you about. So maybe like down here, you'd have like a add a new word button. So uh, to do that, I will go to Android Studio. And, uh, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention kind of while I'm over here in the studio, you might've noticed that there are these things here that say Android test and test. 
like uh, it's got your 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 package, your your kind of uh, where your code is located, and then they also have these different test ones under here. Every project, when you first create it, it also kind of makes these folders for testing, and that's literally like if you want to write like testing code, like like unit tests that try to you know pass in certain parameters and see if it behaves properly. Like this is if you want to write those kind of automated tests for your app. I think it's sort of annoying. <laughs> like uh, testing is great. I don't have anything against testing, but. I don't see why it goes to the trouble of making all these files and folders for you for every single project that you ever create. I think they're trying to encourage you to testing because that's like a good practice. But, you know, some students, I get a little confused, like, what is this stuff? Do I have to edit this? You know, what are these files in here? So <laughs> you have my permission to delete these if you want. You can just right click them and say uh, delete and you say yes. And then it, it goes away, I think. I think sometimes you have to delete them twice. They sort of come back in a zombie form. I said, go away, <laughs> delete. Yes, it goes away. Um, whatever. But anyway, so you, you um, if you want to make another activity, so we right click here in the area where the activities are located, and you say new uh, activity, and then there's different ones, and this is just like when you're making a new project, it asks what kind of activity you want. I think we want an empty activity. And it asks what the name should be. Well, the one for the kind of the main thing, we called it the dictionary activity. Um, if what we're doing here is like making it so that they can add a word, maybe I'd call this the add word activity. And I don't think you need to change any other settings. You can just say finish. And now you got add word activity and you got activity add word.xml. And so, you know, that stuff's going to look just the way that you would expect from the the code we've edited so far, if you open up the XML here, you can kind of edit the layout for this thing. Um, I think in a new project, it would have put like a hello world text view here, and it doesn't do that. It's just completely blank. So I think what I'm picturing is, um, you know, you would be in the main app playing, and then maybe down here, there's a button that says add a word. You click it, it jumps to the other activity, and the other activity says, well, what's the word that you're adding, and what is its definition? And you type those in, and then you say, okay, and it adds that word, and then it goes back to the, the main game, you know? So that's kind of what I want here. So maybe I'll do something like, uh, you know, I'll drag this and say, uh, uh, where's the text? I'll say, uh, okay, type in the word you want to add along with its definition. Okay, so... I don't want to spend a ton of time on like layout and kind of old stuff, but get this attached and get this attached. And so I'm thinking like we would do an edit text to type in. So like here, this will be the word. So maybe it has a hint on it that says uh, word to add. And then, wait, isn't that what that's supposed to, isn't it here supposed to say word to add? Oh, it's because the initial text, it says name. I don't want that. Yeah, okay. Word to add. And maybe I'll call this word to add. And then what? Let's make this nice and wide so it fills the frame. And let's attach this to the bottom here. Let's also do one that is uh, the definition, right? So let's call this word definition. Give it an ID, empty text, give it a hint of, oops, give it a hint of definition. Okay, let's attach the layout so it aligns properly there. And then we probably want some sort of okay button when you're done. Like uh, here, maybe at the bottom, there's a button. Uh, and let's attach it to both sides. Okay, and maybe the button here says, uh, where's the text of the button? Text would say, add this word. And yeah, I think that's pretty good. Um, so that's the second activity. So basically, you set all that up, you get it looking the way you want. Now we have to insert the code so that when you you're in the first activity and you click a button or whatever, it'll jump to this one. I haven't finished doing this code for this one. Like it doesn't actually add any words yet, but it, you know, I, maybe I can get it so that it pops up this thing. I can see this on the, on the emulator. That would be good, right? So if I go back to the original activity, the main activity of the app, I think I said down here at the bottom, I wanted to like add a new word button. 
So let's do that. If I go back to the design view here, if I drag a button down to the bottom, uh, hey, did it not do it? Come on, there. All right. What's the deal here? Button. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, button. And uh, let's set the text of the button to say, add a new word. And I want to bolt the button down to the bottom of the screen here. I always get confused. Ugh. I, this is where like I have trouble doing it in the visual editor and so I actually kind of like to do it better in the XML like I want this thing under the list but that's kind of hard for me to tell it how to do that so I think I want his uh, his bottom to be on the bottom of the parent so I want him at the very bottom of the screen and I want his uh, top to be attached to the bottom of the list of definitions. So I want him at the bottom. Uh, and then the list of definitions, I want its bottom to be attached to the top of this button that I just added to the thing, right? So uh, that's going to be this button here. So I think his his thing is called button two, but let's call it add word button. So uh, his bottom is on the top of the ID add word button. Okay, <laughs> it's in my, I'm only making it worse. Help! I just I haven't quite said enough properties here, right? So what is missing? His um, the lists top should be underneath the word. Yeah, that all looks pretty good. Which one am I missing here? This button, I want him all the way down there. So his bottom should be at the bottom of parent. Isn't that right? Oh, but it says margin bottom 600 dps. Do you see this? Do you guys enjoy watching me suffer and fail? Is this, is this what's happening here? OK, wait. Um, eight. Also, my font's too small. I'm sorry. Hold on a sec. Uh, font. I'm going to make the increased font size. I want that to be control plus and then decrease font size. I want that to be control minus. OK, so OK, there. So I know you couldn't read it, so whatever. Um, I think I have a new button at the bottom. It looks pretty good. I'm, I'm feeling good about myself. OK, add a new word. And then uh, I want to make it so that when you click on this button, it'll open up that second activity that we're starting to create. Okay, so let me teach you how to do that. We got a lot of pieces. We got to glue the pieces together here. So we did this. Now, um, just so you know, you don't have to do this, but when you add an activity to your, your project, um, there is this file that's part of your project that's called a manifest file. And I haven't ever mentioned it before because it wasn't necessary to talk about it, but this is like a file, an XML file that's in your project. And it kind of describes some attributes about your project. It tells you the name of the project. It also has a list of every activity that is part of that project. And when you are in Android Studio and then you add another activity to your project, it automatically updates this file to list all the activities that you've added. Um, the reason I'm telling you about it, like in theory today, we also don't need to edit this file at all. So you don't have to do anything here. But the reason I'm telling you about it is because if you just like went and downloaded some .kt files off the internet or some XML files off the internet, and then you put them in your project in the folders or whatever, when you launched your app, it wouldn't recognize those activities. You wouldn't be able to run them or see them or whatever because they wouldn't be listed in here. So the app is super strict. It only lets you use activities that are listed in the manifest. And uh, maybe I'll ask you why. Like, why do you think Android is picky about that and doesn't just let random activities in the folder run themselves or be part of the app? What do you think? Any guesses? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably easier to design code this way because you can adjust the manifest to incorporate activities rather than, like, have to like you know upload the whole package again or like change stuff about the files 
And maybe there's also a security concern. Yeah, I think those are both good points. And uh, I think probably the primary motivator here is the security aspect. Um, there is a danger where like, if you guys have an app that you trust, like it's your banking app or it's a Twitter app or whatever, Grinder, whatever app you like um, that you trust for whatever reason, you're sort of trusting that whoever wrote the code for that wrote good, fair, reasonable code that's not going to do evil stuff to your phone, like hack it or steal your personal information or whatever. So um, if you didn't have something like this, it might be easier for somebody to like maliciously insert another piece of code or another activity that wasn't supposed to be there, and it would trick you into clicking on it or something like that. So anyway, I guess my point is just I've had this come up where like a student downloads some code that I wrote in class. And then they put it in their project in their folder. And then they write some code that says, launch that activity. And then the whole app crashes and it says, no, I won't launch that. I refuse to. And then they're like, Marty, how come I can't run the code? It's probably because it's not listed in here. So um, where this file is, is um, in your project over here. On the left side, they have a view of all these different things. And you know, it's got like your code and your resources and these build scripts and stuff. But there's also a folder that says manifests. And there's this Android manifest.xml. And you don't really need to look at it, but there is the dictionary activity that we started with. And somehow in here it says this is the main activity that should launch when you first load up the app. Again, I don't, you don't need to like know what all these different things mean or whatever, but this one is like the main activity that should start with. And then I also have the add word activity because we told the Android Studio to include that in our project as well. So just FYI, that's here. We'll come back to that file later on in the course. We might edit that file for other reasons, but there it is. Um, OK, so if you want to have multiple activities and you want one of them to launch another one, the mechanism for doing that in Android is called an intent. An intent is an object that you can create. And it represents your intention to perform an action. I don't know if this is a great name. I think it's a little bit of a confusing concept. but. This is like an object that you can use when your activity wants to fire up some other thing. And that other thing could be another activity. Um, it can also be used when you want to launch certain system services, like if you want to initiate the phone dialer to call somebody, or if you want to initiate the sending of a text message or launching of the browser. You can do things like that. You can access various system services using these intents. Um, so you know, I'll teach you how they work in a second. But just basically, this is a term that you should know about. As an Android developer, you got to know what intents are and how to use them. Of course, now I can make some dumb joke about how this is a really intense course. Right? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, that's the appropriate amount of laughter. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I'll show you a little bit more about how intents work. But like, basically, the short answer is you create an object that's an intent object. Optionally, you can then insert some information into the intent, which would be like parameters. Like if activity A is going to launch activity B, you might want A to send some information over to B that, about what it should do. And that information can be like bundled inside of the intent. Then you'd say, OK, go. And then it goes to the other activity and sends along that information. I'll show you how it works. So here are some of the cases where you would use an intent. The one we're going to see first today is one activity wants to start another activity. The other thing that you can do with intents is what's called starting a service. I haven't talked about that yet. I will teach you more about that later in the course. The service is like an app, but it runs in the background. Like, have you ever noticed, even if you're not using, uh, you know, whatever, uh, you know, Snapchat or WhatsApp or some sort of app, you can still receive notifications. You can still receive messages. That's because those apps are running these like services in the background on your phone. They're they're running a process that sort of sits idle without a user interface, but it's still running code. It's still listening for messages. That's called a service. So you can use an intent to start or talk to a service. There are also lots of system services. Like I mentioned some things like phone dialers or cameras or media playing. Uh, those, are, those are like service things that runs on your phone. You can talk to those with intents. You can also have apps that talk to other apps using intent. There's lots of stuff you can do with these things. It's kind of cool. So. Anyway, I, I would say, you know, I don't, I don't know if I love this like system for how this works. The strength of it, the thing I do like about it, if anything, is that once you learn how it works, you can use it to do a lot of different stuff. So, you know, later in the course, I'll be like, hey, guess how you do so and so, and then you'll say, use an intent, and you know, that'll be like the answer to every question starting in week three of this uh, course. So, how do you make an intent? Well, 
In, in uh, Kotlin, you create a, a, an object of type intent. Like, by the way, if you're if trouble reading some of this Kotlin code sometimes, like that line one that says val my intent equals intent, like that's, I'm constructing an object. Like basically in Java, after that equal sign, you would have said equals new intent. Like I'm creating a new object, but in Kotlin, you just don't say new. You just don't need that keyword. But like, if you're thinking like, what does that mean in a language I'm good at? You know, <laughs> this is like line one there is me. I'm creating a, an object of type intent. I'm storing it in a variable named my intent. So when you create an intent, you pass two parameters. You pass like your activity as the first parameter, and that's called this. And then the second parameter is kind of weird, but it's the name of the other activity that you want to start up. But you don't just write the name of the activity, you write the name of the activity followed by colon colon class dot Java. Um, and what that is is that you're referring to a Java class object. Uh, I think that syntax is really ridiculous, but you're basically telling it that it's going to launch an object of that type, and that's the syntax for how you say that. Once you create the intent, you say start activity, which is the name of a <coughs> method that is inside of the activity class. So like your activity code, your .kt file, has that method in it. And so you call that method, and you pass your intent as a parameter to that method, and then it will immediately jump you to the other activity. That's how it works. Not very hard. Um, the other thing I did mention a few minutes ago that an intent can like stuff information inside that you want to pass from activity A to activity B. And if you do want to do that, this is the syntax for how to do that. It's called extra variables. And I guess I would say if you're looking for a mental model here, you could think of this intent as being almost like a map that maps from keys to value. So you can store some arbitrary number of key value pairs inside of the intent before you launch the other activity. So let's, let's you know, play with this a little bit, okay? Um, if you go back to our dictionary program, we got this button here, add new word. So um, in the Kotlin code for the main dictionary activity, I'm going to, we've already got a bunch of code here from like last week, but let's add a new function called uh, add word button. I guess we don't use underscores, add word button click that takes a view that's a view. And then um, we'll work on that in a second. But basically, the reason I have that function is so that when you, when you click the add word button, I want it to call that function, right? So over here, I will say on click, I want to call add word button click, right? Click this button at the bottom here. OK, so now what I want it to do is I want it to launch the other activity. So. I write something like val my intent equals intent. And do you remember what the two uh, parameters are? It's the first one? Yes. This, and then what? The name of the activity. So I want to run the one that we're just making. It's called add word activity colon colon class dot Java. <laughs> what a mess. That's pretty reprehensible. Like, why do they make me write that? Uh, whatever. But um, so now I've created the intent, and now I, I, I tell it to go. So I say start activity, and I pass my intent. Okay. And if you like short code, you could even say start activity and pass that as the parameter. You could do that. I, I personally don't like that, so I'm going to put it back. But you can do that if that's what you prefer. Yeah. Is there any reason why we would, why we would use another package context other than this? Oh, 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 like for that first parameter? Yeah, it, it says package context this. Because it's, it's, it's hinting to me the name of the parameter that I'm passing where I wrote this. Um, why would you ever pass anything other than this? The answer, I think, would be like if you ever want to have a piece of code that isn't your activity, but that launches an activity. Like maybe you have a helper class that helps you write this code, and that helper wants to launch an activity. You wouldn't have the helper say this, because like the person you pass there has to be like an activity object. So that helper class would need to have a reference to the activity, then it would have to pass that. And so yeah, I mean, you sometimes don't pass this. But I think in a typical context, you do pass this. So, I mean, so in my opinion, like how they should have designed this was like, fine, you could have this system that we just did here, but there should be like a simple version where you just say start activity and then you just pass that. And then, you know what I mean? Like yeah. they should have had a simpler version of this, but uh, in fact, I actually, 
I, I know a guy who works on the um, the Android team, and I was like, can I get lunch with you? Because like I have like this long list of stuff that's stupid that I want you guys to fix. And uh, but that was like a year or two ago. And what he said to me was, let's wait till after the Kotlin uh, change happens, because I think that's going to like fix a lot of it. And <laughs> it fixed some, but I was like, hey, you didn't fix this one. But anyway, um, so that starts the activity. Let's let me just write a little comment here that says uh, launch the add word activity. So let's go try it out. We wrote a little bit of new code. Let's go see if it works in the emulator. So it's building, it's running. So I get a few minutes to wait while it loads. Uh, my wife and I watched The Bachelor last night. It's pretty good. Colton really trimming down the roster of gals. Uh, I'm very offended because there's a lot of age shaming going on this season. The like under 30 gals are really feuding with over 30 gals. They're calling them Cougar Town and stuff. And I just don't think that's cool because I'm over 30, so I'm deeply offended. But oh, we're done. Okay. So um, anyway, <laughs> we got a new button. We can click it to add a new word. Uh, if I tap that button, hey, it jumps to the, the other activity. Hooray. Um, okay, so a couple of things. Uh, I think I have this in my slides coming up in a second. It's important to understand kind of the context of what's going on here. Like on your phone at any given time, you could have multiple apps that are like active because you launch an app and then you go back to the main screen and you launch another app. Like you can have multiple apps that you're kind of running at the same time, but one of them is active at a time. And within a given app, you're always looking at a given activity within that app. Like you can't have an activity that takes up half the screen and then some other activity that takes up a third of the screen. Like you, you're always in an activity that like fills your screen, you know what I mean? But even though I'm in this activity, the other one is like underneath it. They're kind of both, they're both running, but like one of them is active and listening to me at a time. And I'm gonna talk more on Thursday about what we call the activity life cycle. Like an activity can be in different states, like active on screen, it can be paused, it can be stopped, it can be running, it can be doing all these different things. But I guess my point is just that this thing is here and I see this, but the other one that I was in before is still there, it's just underneath, it's just waiting. And actually there's like a back button usually on most phones and most devices and if you click it, it actually will take you back to the original activity where you came from. Um, and then there's a little more to it. Like, so technically what that is, is it's called an activity stack. If activity A launches activity B and then activity B launches activity C, then you have like a CBA like stack uh, in the computer science sense of the word, right? So when you're done with activity C, typically that closes or pops off the stack and then you go back to B where you came from and stuff like that. Uh, you can customize that and maybe you go A goes to B goes to C and then when you're done with C you want to jump all the way back to A. Like you could do stuff like that. It's just the default is you sort of pop off one level at a time when you're done. Anyway, I didn't really write the code to actually add the new word, but I can click the button and it can pop up the other activity. So then at this point, a lot of what's left to do is stuff we've done before. There's a few more new pieces of, of plumbing here, but let's talk about um, some of the rest to kind of actually get it to work. Now, once we click that and we do start activity, the, um, the add word activity runs, you know, it, it launches, it uses this layout to set up the widgets on the screen, and then for any kind of behavior to occur, that event behavior would be in this addwordactivity.kt file here. So like I think the only event that we really need to think about is just here if they click add word, we have to like add that word to the dictionary, right? So let's talk about that for a second. Um, if this button here is the, you know, add the word button, we need some kind of on-click for that, so maybe this is the fun uh, let's add the word view view. So then when they click this button, when they click this button on click, it should do let's add the word, right? So now we need to write the code here to actually do the adding of the word. Um, now that means we have to write data out to a file, right? Because the if you don't remember this little project, the res raw folder has this gre words.txt file, right? And so all the data from our app comes from there. So this gets a little interesting and it, it gets into like writing file data as opposed to reading file data. One thing that's a little counterintuitive is that um, 
even if we wanted to, we cannot actually have our app add anything to this file because the file itself gets kind of frozen and baked into the app's binary itself. And so like you can't really reach in there and modify that. But so that's I think it's a little confusing because like, you know, if you're used to 106, 106 A or B or whatever, you just think of it as like, oh, there's some file. So what we would do is you would ask the user for a word and a definition, and then we'd go like append to the end of this file a new line with that stuff in it, right? That's like what you would expect to do. And like that doesn't really work here because this file is sort of frozen for all time. Once you compile the app, it just gets like encased in there like Han Solo and Carbonite or something, right? Um, except that you could still read him. But um, we, what we, so that's not possible for us to modify this file. So given that that's the case, how do we like add words to the dictionary? What do you guys think we should actually do then if this file is fixed? Do you have an idea? Um, you create a duplicate file. <laughs> yeah, and we could make file another file. That duplicate file and... Yeah, so I mean, maybe that's kind of unclear. Like, I think it's a hard question to understand, but like you could make files in your app. You could still make a file. And you could put contents in that file. You can modify the contents of a file. You just can't modify this file. So I think maybe what we would do then is make like a, this is the existing starting words, and then maybe a second file that's like the new words that you have added. And when the app runs, we read both of them and merge them, like union them in. And yeah, something like that. Is that what you're going to say too, Trip? Or do you have a different suggestion? A uh, different suggestion that probably wouldn't work considering you'd have to like restart. I was saying like, because we read it into some kind of data structure. But if you read it, if you just add it to the data structure, it probably wouldn't work. Run over for oh no! I'm glad you said that. Yeah, you said like add it because because in the in the code of the app, the words that you read in like get put into where was it like a, a a hash map of words mapped to. So what you could do is instead of modify the file, you could take the new word the person had typed and you could put it in that map, and then while you're playing the game, the new word would appear as a choice. It would be there for all purposes. The app would seem to have this new word added to it, but that would, the persistence is a problem. Like the, the length of time that the new word would be there would be only until the app closed. If you run it again tomorrow, the new word would be forgotten because the app would like reload itself from memory. Uh, that's another thing we're gonna talk a little bit about on Thursday is like, when does the app sort of forget something like that? Like if, I, if I'm in the app and I jump away to go to Twitter for a second and then I jump back to the app, will it have forgotten what I was doing? And the answer is maybe, <laughs> and I don't want to talk about it yet. But like, basically, what you're—I I mean, I, I know that you were kind of saying you didn't think that would totally work, but I'm glad you mentioned it because it kind of works. But then it doesn't. Yeah, it sort of doesn't persist. Like, have you guys seen this movie Memento? The guy—he uh, can't remember anything, so you know he's uh, people trying to kill him, and he's trying to find the, his wife's murderer and stuff. But his brain got messed up, so he. He forgets things after a few seconds, so he has to like write stuff down and like tattoo himself with <laughs> his clues that he's looking for. It's kind of like you're that guy if you uh, if you don't save this stuff to the file, you won't remember it very long. So um, anyway, I think we do need to do something like you said, which is to make a a file to store these words in. So let's talk about that for a second. I mean, sometimes we'll do this where we kind of jump around to a topic from before if we need to revisit it. So we talked about files before. And let me just jump to some of the code examples here. Um, where is it? So like we talked about reading a file. We did something kind of like this to read a file. But if you want to write a file, if you want to do that, you have to use an object called a print stream. Print stream is just a Java object, and it also exists in Kotlin. There's a function in the activity called open file output. You can use it to make a new file. You write the name of the file as a string, and then you have to write this constant called mode private to say that it's a private file so that other apps can't read it. And then once you have that print stream object, it has a println method that you can call, and you pass a string, and it'll add that line as a line to that file. And if you write that file and then later you want to read it again, you can read it by making a scanner or a buffered reader and you say open file input. So, so it's not super hard to do. Uh, I would say the hardest thing about dealing with files in Android is like when it doesn't work, it's hard to go diagnose sometimes because you can't just open up a directory tree and look at the file. Like the file's buried inside of your emulator somewhere. So it does uh, test your, you, know, you have to have careful eyes and make sure you don't write the code wrong. And if it is wrong, you have to insert some good debugging or logging code to kind of track down what the heck is wrong, why isn't it working. So hopefully we can get to work. Um, let's 
let's try to see if we could do this here. So um, remember what we're doing is we have this add word activity. They type in a word here and they type in a definition here and then they click add and I just want to go put that in that file, right? So let's try to make some progress on that. How do I actually get a hold of the word and the definition in my code over here? You know I want like val word equals something and I want val definition equals something. Like what do I, how do I get them? Yeah? You, you type their IDs when you do dot text dot string. Yeah, so the ID of the widgets for these two edit text views here. So I think I called them, oh, they're just, wait, text, it's not that one. It's the edit text called word to add and word definition. Those are the IDs. So you said word, oops, how do I, word to add dot text dot to string. And then the other one is word definition dot text dot to string. Yeah, okay, so I've got those. And I think, so So that would be something like, you know, if the, if the word is Marty-esque and then the definition is, you know, having or containing awesomeness or whatever, right? Then I've got those as strings. Now, if that wants to go into the file, this is supposed to be all one line where you say, like, you know, uh, Marty-esque, Marty-esque Q, no. <laughs> Uh, yeah, then slash T, you know, you put like a, a tab, right? That's the format the input has in the original file, so we should kind of match that, right? So, I mean, like, probably you have like a line that's like dollar word slash T dollar defin, you know, like something like that. Oops. Uh, remember how you can, you can write a string that inserts other variables by just putting a, the names of those variables with a dollar sign in front of them? If you're more of a Java person, you could have said, word plus slash t plus def. You could have done that too, right? But So now I've got it all as like a line. I want to put that line into a file. So um, we didn't really pick a file name, but maybe we could call it like extra words dot text or something like that. So that seems like maybe we should make kind of a constant for that. So maybe up here we do like private val uh, words file name equals extra words.txt, something like that. Uh, I think in Kotlin you can say const val, but I don't know why you would need to say that because it's already constant, but whatever. So um, let's open that as a file and write this word, this line out to that file. So if I go and kind of steal some of this, paste, doesn't know what a print stream is, so I'll hit alt enter to import it. Um, instead of out.txt, I'll use that constant what did I call it? I called it uh, words file name, words file name, mode private. And instead of print printlining hello world, I'll print lin line, and then I'll do close. Um, I think, so there's an issue of like, what if we do this several times? Uh, it doesn't append, it, uh, it overwrites, I think. So I'm pretty sure there's like an appending mode, uh, but I don't remember how to do it. Because you know what I mean? Like if you've already added 10 words in the past and this is the 11th one, I don't want the 11th one to erase the other 10. But by default, when you make a new print stream, it like replaces the file. Con I don't want to replace, I want to append. So I think there's, if I just Google like Kotlin file output append, I'm pretty sure there's like a mode underscore append flag or something. Let me just check real quick. But I'm trying to convince you that it's okay to Google stuff. Uh, this doesn't look good. How about Kotlin Android? I just forget what it's called. Append text? File.append. Kotlin append file. Uh, da, 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 da. Is it in my slides? I don't know. You would think I would know my own stuff here. Uh, true. Do I pass a true flag? Print buffer writer. Look at all this stuff. Of course, part of the problem is you just encounter like weird shit. Like, what is this dot use thing? You know, so I, I think that's one of the things when you when you play with a uh, new language and you Google stuff, you find like ten different ways to do stuff. One thing I didn't show you guys that you can do when you open a file. Um, you know, you write data to the file and then you're supposed to close the file. 
and if you don't close the file, sometimes it doesn't like save the data properly or whatever. And somebody decided this is like really bad uh, bug, you know, that if you forgot to close something. So somebody thought this was such an important bug that like they have this syntax where you can say like outstream.use bracket, and then you can like print whatever it is that you want to print. And then when you're done doing that, it'll automatically close it for you. You know what I mean? Like, but I just, I just don't think it's interesting, so I didn't teach you that syntax. I'm going to undo that. But anyway, maybe for now, I will leave this. I thought there was a, wait, let me, let me just look at my file slides real quick to see if I have the thing for append, append. No, I don't have it in my slides. <laughs> oh, well. Um, tough luck. I'll come back to that. I'll look for that later. But you open the file, you write the new line of text, and you close the file. So now there's a couple things we need to do here. One thing is we want the main app to read that new word and you know use that new word when it's playing the game, right? The other thing is like, I mean, there's, there's like initial app startup when it first loads up the app. I want it to notice the new words that I've been adding here. And the other thing is like right now, as I'm using the app now, I want it to immediately incorporate the new words now as opposed to like the next time I launch the app, I want it to use the new words, you know? So there's a couple different ways that you could do this. Um, I think this really gets into like data flow, data ownership issues because like right here, I've got the new word and I've got its definition but this guy isn't the one who needs it. I really want that new stuff to get back there to the old activity because he's the one who has this map and stuff. And so like, then you start asking like, how does this guy add a new pair to the map of the other guy? You know what I mean? Like, because they can't communicate, like he can't access the private variables of the other activity, you know? So you get into confusing issues like that. So I do want to talk about that. Um, I'm going to go back to my slides for a second. So let's see, let me show you, where is it, hold on, sending back a result. Okay, so now we're in the situation where activity A has launched activity B, and activity B has some sort of com completion, they're done, they want to go back to activity A. So the way you can do that is, I mean I showed you there was like a back button on the bottom of the screen, but what you can do is your activity can call a method named finish. Finish method closes your activity and goes back where you were spawned from. So if I'm in activity B, it'll go back to activity A. But kind of in the same way that intents can pass information almost like parameters, you can also use intents to return information. And so I think this is a situation where we might want to do that, where you know the main activity with the list of words popped up the other activity where you could add a new word. Now that we've done that, we want to maybe send back the new word and its definition back to the original one so that he can add them to his data structures and incorporate them into gameplay. And so the way you do that, if you want to do that sort of thing, is you make a new intent with no parameters at all, you put the extra data into it, you say set result, result okay, and you pass the intent, and then you say finish. And that's a little bit confusing, but it's not that hard once you get used to it. So over here, this is the um, add word activity. We just wrote that to the file. So now what we'll do is we'll say, go back to the main activity. And here's what we'll do. We'll say intent, my intent equals intent. Oh, actually, you say uh, val intent equals intent. Sorry, I still have sort of Java flashbacks here. Um, then you say my intent dot put extra. And you say the key and the value. This is, again, it's like a map or something. So maybe I'll say the word is word and put extra definition is the definition. And now you say set result, result OK, comma, my intent. And then you say finish. So that'll close me, and it'll send this stuff back to the person who spawned me. OK? Does it make sense what I'm doing here? And I guess I'll say uh, and return the word and definition to them, right? OK, well, that's not so bad. But <laughs> where it gets a little weird is like, OK, now how do, I, how do I have the main activity look at this stuff? How does he catch that when that comes back? Because remember, the main activity guy, you clicked on the button on him, and that launched this code here, where you said, I want a new intent to launch the other guy, 
start activity. So I think what you might imagine is maybe the stuff that he sends back gets like returned to here. You know, maybe you'd say like uh, val result equals that or something. <laughs> but that would be way too simple. That would make a lot of sense. So of course that's not what Android does. Um, this comes into this sort of uh, return versus callback uh, programming uh, uh, dichotomy. So basically what happens is start activity launches the other one, the one for adding a new word. But it doesn't just like sit there and wait. It doesn't have a return value or whatever. If the other guy sends information back to here, to the original first activity, it will give the information to this guy by calling a certain method on this guy, a different method. And if I want to look at that information, I have to write that method and sort of write the code that I want to use to respond to that information here. It's a little bit like an event handler. So I think it's a little bit confusing. I'll sort of show you an example here. Um, if you want to wait for the other activity to give you back a result, there's a couple changes you need to make. Instead of saying start activity, you say start activity for result. And then you write a method called on activity result that will catch the result that comes back and you can handle it, you can process it. So <laughs> I think it's a little bit confusing. Um, so let me show you. I'll just try to show you. I think it's best shown by example. So instead of saying start activity, you're going to say, hey, I want to start that activity, but I want a result to come back from it. Now that underlines because it expects two parameters, not just one. Uh, let me show you the, the um, uh, example. You start the activity, but you also pass in, because the, nothing is simple in Android, you not only pass in the intent, but you pass in some magical integer code. Why do you have to do this? <laughs> I sometimes say this in 106 as well. Sometimes there's just some bullshit when you code, and it's there for your job security, right? Like. If this were easy, somebody would be stealing our jobs and we wouldn't make very much money. But since it's full of all this bullshit, it's hard and only we chosen few can do it, so we're gonna make lots of money. I guess it all works out in the end. Um, you have to pass in some sort of magical code when you start the activity. And then when the activity's done, it sends you back the same code. Hey, you asked for uh, result number one, two, three. I've got result number one, two, three for you right here. The reason that they do this, I mean, I'm, I'm criticizing this design, but the reason that they do it this way is because you could be starting different things and maybe different stuff might come back with different messages and you want to be able to disambiguate whose result has come back. This particular app doesn't have such an issue because we only start one thing and wait for the one thing to come back. But a more complicated app, you might be sending out internet messages and packets and you're waiting for different responses. And so like this is meant to be versatile for handling different kind of results that come in. So you make up a code, you pass in the code, you write a method function called on activity result, and you look for that code to come back to you. And if it did, you get an intent and you can unpack the intent to see what's inside of it. So let me, let me try to put all these pieces together. Um, you, you go up here and you make some kind of code. You don't have to make the code into a variable, but I think most people do. So you say something like private val uh, add word stupid code equals whatever. Uh, the, the, the one thing I discovered, uh, I think it was the last time I was teaching this class, like it could be basically any number you want as long as you're consistent, but it has to be a number between 1 and 65535. Because one time I was just bullshitting around and I said, oh, 90210, like, haha, like Beverly Hills 90210. And it doesn't work because it's too big. <laughs> and so um, I discovered that the hard way. This is why I can't make a living in coding anymore. So, um, but something like 1234 would be fine <laughs> or whatever. Um, yeah, what, what I often do in this class is I do like 193, one. And if I had another one, it would be 193, two. You know what I mean? It's like those are our codes for this class or something. But um, anyway, so I use this stupid code. And then down here, when you start the activity, you say, here, use that stupid code. Now, I can write the code that I want it to run when the other activity comes back to me. That is a method that's called on activity result. So <clears throat> that method accepts three parameters. Uh, wait, why is it underlining? Oh, it needs a, a type. Wait, what if I, uh, wait. 
What if I actually I haven't tried on activity result there. Okay, so actually I think I think the best way to write this code in the editor is just to from a blank white space just start typing not even the return type or anything or fun just write on activity result and then boom press enter and it just like writes the whole thing out for you. Now you can fill it in. So this when, when the second activity comes back to me, it will call this method on me. And so this is where I can respond to the returning from the second activity. What do I want to do? Well, the parameters here are a request code, a result code, and some intent that comes back with it. Um, the request code, I believe, is this stupid code that I passed in. The result code is like if this guy wants to send back some sort of integer status of what happened, he's sending back result okay. That's like a, a result status code or something. I don't think I need to worry about that very much. And then this intent is like those parameters that they stuffed in there for me. So I think what you're supposed to do here is you're supposed to say if the request code is the add word stupid code that I was hoping for, um, I don't know what else it would be, but like I think it's considered good practice to make sure those two things match up. Then it's like unpack the word and definition sent back from the add word activity. Okay. So how do I unpack those things? Well, they send back their stuff using this my intent. If I guess it would make it clearer for you, I can come back here and I can call this my intent. So like those parameters that they stuffed in here, they stuffed one in called word and they stuffed one in called defin. So I can go back here and I can say like val word equals my intent dot get string extra called word. And I can say val defin equals get the string extra called defin. So this is me just pulling back out the data that the other guy is sending back to me, okay? There's a tiny, tiny syntax problem here. It doesn't like this dot. You have any notion of what the heck is going on here? Yeah, yeah. I think intent with a question mark is a nullable type. And so you need to like non-null it before that you can grab it. Yeah. So this is a California intent question mark, right? So like Remember, I think we talked about that briefly in one of the previous lectures. Um, Kotlin is concerned with nullness, whether a value could be null or not, whether it's allowed to be null or not. So I think in general, the design philosophy of Kotlin is to try to restrict nullness and not have nullness so we don't have to worry about it as much as possible, right? But here, it's an intent question mark, which as you say, means it could be an intent or it could be null. So I guess I would ask you the question of like, why do you think here it allows a null? You know, why, you know, a lot of the other code we've been working with doesn't have any question marks and nulls. Why do you think here they make me think about null or deal with null? Any ideas? I mean, why not just make it be intent without a question mark? Why not design it that way? What do you think? Because it's possible the second activity doesn't create an intent to send the data back. Yeah, so okay, that's a good so actually like to be frank, I don't know the answer, but like we're just educated guessing what the answer is. I think we can probably figure out. So like it's possible to not do any of that stuff. You could just say finish. This is in the second activity. You could just say finish and you never made an intent, you never put anything in it. So then what is this guy supposed to send back? Maybe it sends back a null in that case, right? So maybe that's why you might get a null back here. Yeah, that's a good answer. I think another answer is just that this all comes back from Java land, like this Kotlin function is talking to some Java code somewhere and probably the Java code has nulls. And so like in order to interact with that Java code, it has to deal with nulls. Okay, well, so like, how do we deal with these nullable types? Like, how do I get it so I could just do this? Like, how do I get around this? This doesn't compile right now, so I have to like do something about this, right? What do I do? Somebody I haven't heard from yet. Yeah. Is this like we use in the length function in the num when you're talking about num? Let's just have like a question mark after the decimal point and then the question mark and semicolon. 
Yeah. So okay, there's like there's like two or three different ways you can deal with this. Let me just point out all of them, and I think yours is a good one. And let me just point out the strength and weaknesses, all the different ways you can deal with this crap. Because I think you're going to have to deal with this when you write Android code. So one way is you can do what's called called the guarded dereference operator. You can say question mark dot, which means if it isn't null, then please call the get string extra method. Otherwise, don't call the method. <laughs> so um, you can do that. Of course, the problem with doing that is then it's unclear, like, well, if my intent is null, then what should the val word be set to? What should the val definition be set to? So that can be a little bit ambiguous. So you mentioned that there's a further operator where you can say, well, question colon empty string, or you know that means like if it was null, then do the backup, the default of empty. So you can do that. That's fine. Although I, I just I do feel like this starts to get hard to read. It's kind of operator soup here, you know. So that is certainly a way that you could do this. Um, let me undo for a second. There are other ways you can deal with this nullness stuff. Do you know any other? Do you remember any other ways or know any other ways you can handle this situation? We didn't spend a lot of time on it, so it's okay if you don't remember. Yeah. You can use a double exclamation point. You can use the New York operator <laughs> to override the California operator. You can say, hey, I insist only that you. Stuff. What's that? Only one stuff. Only one exclamation? Oh, is it only one? Yeah, is it just like no, that? No, no, no. Just delete the second one. Oh, you don't need to do it the second time? I see, because, yeah, if. Yeah, actually, that's interesting because if I. If I put it in both places, it actually underlines it and says, you don't need it here. So what the, remember, what this operator does is it basically says just, I don't care if it's null, call the method anyway. <laughs> so what you're doing here is sort of devolving to Java semantics where it would crash if this were a null uh, reference variable, which is not that big of a deal. But what, what it's saying is like, you don't need to write this twice because if it would have crashed, it would have crashed here. So I just assume that it's not null if you get to here. Yeah, so that's also a good way that you can deal with it that way. Um, I think most people, when they talk about Android coding style, they don't like you to use this unless you have to, because it's kind of like, a, you know, it's, it's not really very safe. I think the whole point of this nullness, question mark, exclamation stuff is to be more safe so that you're less likely to crash your program because of a null pointer. And this just like turns that safety off. So I think another way to do it is if you just say, if my intent is not null, then do this. And then what you find is, if it's surrounded by such an if statement, it now does let you do this. Because the compiler can tell that there's no chance of it being null inside of this if statement anymore. So I actually think that's the best way to write this particular code, just because it I don't have to have all those crazy question operators and stuff. I just I like this version better for this particular case. So anyway, if it's not null, we get the word in the definition. The whole point of doing that, we passed it back to here so that we could add it to the data structures here so that it would become part of the, the game, right? So let's do, we have, a, we have a map up here called word to definition. And I forget what these ones are. We might have to add it to a multiple structure. We have, we have to add this one, right? So word to definition. Dot, uh, dot put word comma defin there. Or I think you can also say that as bracket word equals defin. You can do that either way, I think. So, okay. So now it's added to the data structures of the app. Let me just double check. I forget if we have to add it to any of the other data structures. So when you actually read the file, you, uh, you also add it to this words piece. So I have to add that to the word. Okay, so then I'll say uh, words dot add word. So there, now it's like part of the game, part of the data. Um, I want to test it, right? Because I've been writing a lot of new code. I want to test the new code out. But um, this file is so big that like if we add one more word, the odds that we're going to get the new word are pretty low, right? So that's actually going to be kind of hard to test this. So smart Stanford people, how do I make it easier to test this? I don't want to play this game for two hours and see if my new word pops up or not, right? Something quick and simple. Delete all the words. <laughs> yeah, make the file smaller. <laughs> yeah, how about like, uh, let's just make it so there's only five words in the file. Oh boy, I don't want to lose them. Uh, just load up a text editor and paste them. And then I'll just save this. 
save. Okay, now in theory, it's going to do five random options, and it's going to be all of those, right? So if I add a sixth word, it's very likely to be seen, I think, right? Okay, well, let's give it a try. Let's see if this works. And certainly, we've changed a lot of stuff, so it's entirely possible that it might not work, but let's find out. Let's see what happens. Okay. Vocab builder game. So, you know, I'll just play it a couple times. It's always doing those A words because we only have five words in the in the dictionary. Oh yeah, question. Uh, did you have a call like notify data section? Oh, notify uh, oh the adapter to tell the adapter that we have new So I think I mean in the in the code we were adding I didn't, but I think what was happening was like when you when you click on the item of the list to like answer, it will then set up the list again. And that picks a random correct word and five random definitions and puts them in the array list. And then that calls notify. So I think it'll already do it from the flow of code we already have. But you're totally right that like changing collections, you have to at some point call that notify method. Let, let me just jump into this setup list method somewhere down here at the bottom of that. Uh, oh, so I think what I'm doing instead is I'm just making a new adapter, which I think functionally also will suffice for that. So um, let's try, let's test it, right? So let's do, there, there's only A words here. So let's add a new word and let's call it uh, Marty-esque. And the definition is uh, able to uh, make, uh, you know, 80 minutes seem like 800 <laughs> and uh, that I will click add and it went back now you know this isn't a great UI we should probably like pop a toast that says like you added a word or whatever we, we should have better UI than this but like in theory it's here we don't see it yet but let me just like pick a definition so we can start a new play here abate hey look there's my new, my definition is in there, which had a five out of six chance of happening, right? But let me see if I can get Marty-esque up at the top here. Hey, there I am, able to make 80 minutes seem like 800. Bam, I did it, you got it. So like, yay, it basically works, right? Um, <clears throat> so we got two activities and the two activities are talking to each other. Um, I didn't show, you know, this app, I didn't show every single aspect of the syntax in the slides. Like, I showed how, you know, activity A can launch activity B, and then I showed activity B sending parameters back to activity A when it was done. One thing I didn't show was, like, if A wants to launch B, sometimes A wants to send information to B. Like, I didn't talk about sending information that way. But the way to do that is, I mean, you could just use similar things to what we've seen so far. So we had this, like, add click, this is in the uh, main activity, where you say I want a new intent to launch the second activity, and then you start activity for result. Well, between creating the intent and starting, you can put information in here. You can say like my intent dot put extra, and then you can put the name of the thing and then the value that you want it to have. Um, we didn't need that for this app because like when you're adding a new word, I don't need to like pass it any details about that. But you could, I guess I just want to make sure I've shown you all the pieces here. So I could pass something like, you know, a parameter called like teacher and the value is Marty. And um, how, you would, how you would use this would be, you know, this key and value pair would be sent to the second activity when it's starting up. So like this add word activity here, when he starts up, he's going to receive that intent with that information. So I want to talk about like where does he get that and how does he look at that? Like where does that end up? being. So the answer to that is where? So I, I just did that. I make an intent. I put some extra stuff. I start. <clears throat> the second activity, the, the one that receives that information, remember how we already have seen an activity has its on create method, right? This runs when the activity is first starting up, first being created to appear on the screen. In that method, you actually have access to a, what looks like a variable, this is actually like a, a, a property or something of your object named intent. And that property is like the intent that was used to spawn you. 
And so if you say intent dot, you can like extract these extra parameters out of there and look at them. So like in the uh, case of our app here, this guy passed a parameter named teacher with the value of Marty. So if the add word activity over here wants to see that, in his onCreate, he would say val um, teacher equals my intent dot get string extra for teacher. And I would expect it to have the value Marty in there. I got that information back out. What can I do with that? I don't know. Whatever you want to do with that. You know, you could, you could put it on the, on the screen. You could say, like, word to add dot text equals teacher. Or I don't know. Whatever you want to do with that. Oh, wait, why doesn't that work? Oh, teacher dot to, sorry, sorry to, to, do I have to say to string on that? Wait, why is that not working? Text equals teacher. Why does that not work? It says required editable found string. What if I do like that? Does that work? No. Uh, val teacher colon string. Does the word to add have to be a two string? Does the word to <clears throat> word to add dot text dot to string? Uh, no. Um, do I have to say dot set text? I don't understand why that doesn't work. Wait, that works. <laughs> what? I don't understand. <laughs> um, so, like, in Java, all the different things you might want to look at or modify about a widget have these methods, like get text, set text, get color, set color, get everything, set everything. That's like how you do it in Java. You've probably seen that a bunch in your own coding before, even if it wasn't in Java, you've probably seen that convention, get this and set that, right? In Kotlin, they have this special syntax called property syntax, where they basically like wrap these two things up into a thing called text that just looks like a variable. And so if you want to call get text, instead of that, you just say like, you know, instead of saying like uh, string foo equals get text, you know, uh, my widget dot get text, instead of that, you would do like, you know, uh, val foo equals my widget dot text. It's like it, it converts. It's like equivalent, you know. And then if you wanted to do like my widget dot set text to be like foo, instead of that, you'd say like my widget dot text equals foo. It, it's supposed to be essentially equivalent to write those things uh, without the semicolons in uh, Kotlin. So I guess what I'm a little confused about is probably just I'm being stupid, but like if you say dot text equals teacher, that's supposed to basically be exactly the same as writing set text. The old version set text and get text is still there if you want to call them. For some reason that one works and then one doesn't work. Uh, question, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so if you're in your, your dictionary activity KT, can you make public functions that your add word activity KT can call? Oh, like if, can I just literally make the two KT files call each other's functions? Um, I think the problem with that is like this activity does not have a variable that it can use to talk to the other activity. Like if you're thinking I could write something like dictionary activity dot whatever, like the problem with that is you don't call methods on the class, you call them on the object of the class. This guy does not have a reference to the object. So it's like they don't actually have a way to talk to each other. So like, so for example, if you wanted to count the number of words in your, in your dictionary, and in the dictionary activity KT, you would like create a variable when you load up the file that has the number of words. And then I'm thinking you could make a class that, or a function that is just like plus one, add one to the total, and have it be just a function and then call it on your add word activity when you add the word. Yeah, I mean, I think that like there's two separate questions, right? There's like what can you do? And then there's like what, are you, what should you do? What are you supposed to do? And I think that Android sort of style guides, they don't want activity classes like reaching over and calling each other's methods and stuff. They want a little more isolation than that. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, it has to do with some of it's like security and some of it's bug, you know, isolating the scope of bugs and stuff. And, and also it's things like if your app wants to launch the phone dialer, they don't really want you to be able to reach in and mess with the methods of the phone dialer and stuff. And so for a lot of reasons, basically the communication in either direction between two activities is typically done by them sending intents to each other. It's like, if you want to tell me something, send it to me in an intent, and I'll look at it. 
you want me to send you something back, I'll send it to you with an intent. And that's like this kind of mechanism they've built for these guys to talk to each other. And partly that's because they don't want them to directly have like a variable that they can use to talk directly because then it's like, it kind of like exposes too much of the state and the, and the you know, mechanism of each one to the other. So I happen to know that there there is like one weird way to do this, <laughs> which is to create something called a companion object within That's, the class. A companion object is kind of like a static global so object in a class. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to teach about it today, but I mean, yes, there's like I was talking about can versus should, right? Like, uh, you're not really supposed to do that because it also like static and constant and things that are talking to each other like this. They don't flush out very cleanly. Like if you if you edit your app and recompile it and run it again, it has this feature called instant run where it can like quickly relaunch the app. And like that totally breaks if you have this like static stuff because it doesn't like flush it out properly. And mm. basically it's just kind of black magic stuff. It also doesn't play nice with some of this stuff we talked about, like with forgetting and you leave the app and go to Twitter for a while and you come back. You can get this weird, like stale, crusty data stored in something like that, and it doesn't work and you crash and there's a lot of bad stuff that we haven't talked about because I'm trying to protect you guys from stuff, you know. So but we shouldn't use it. Generally. I think I think in general you should stick to the kind of the intent-based system that they have built for you. Um, I mean, this feature that I'm showing you right now, I was just trying to show you like activity A wants to launch activity B, and it wants to send a parameter on the way as it's doing so. And so this is how you do that. You know, activity A puts extra data in the intent. It calls the start activity or start activity for result. In the second activity, you refer to the intent by the name intent. You pull the extra thingies out. You do whatever you want to do with them. You got them. So, and the place you do that is when the thing's being created, typically. That's where you look at that information and use it for something. So I think if I, if I run this again, what you'll see is if I'm in the main game activity and I click add a word, the text box should say Marty in it because I think I passed that over. I called it teacher and I said it to Marty. So let me try there. So it says Marty in the box at the start. So I was just trying to show you how to pass in a parameter. And frankly, I think that's a little bit more common sometimes than sending back out a parameter like I did here. Passing in is probably a little bit more common, but I did both directions. I passed in the Marty and I passed out the word in the definition when I was done. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so if you, if you scroll back up to the top of your add word, KT, when you make the, um, the extra words text file, is, are you making the file or does it already exist? Like right. So the one, there's a couple of pieces missing here. And actually, I don't know if, you know, like I, don't, I definitely don't ever want to keep you guys longer. The lectures are long enough. But um, there's two things here that are sort of missing that I would want to patch up before I would say we're kind of done with this. One is that when we're opening this file to write it, we are replacing the previous content. So if I add a word and then I add another word, the second one, replace, I lose the first one, right? That's bad. And the second thing that's wrong, which might be even more significant, is it doesn't remember um, to load the new words when I launch the app. When I first launch the app, it reads all the words from uh, where? So let me go to the start. The original main activity, when you create it, we read the dictionary file. But we don't have any code that reads the extra words file. We need to do that when the app loads up. So that if you started with five words and you added three more, you got eight. If you quit the app and you come back next week, it should reload all eight. This does not. It reloads only the original five. So how I would do that, and I think what I'm going to do is just because we only have a couple minutes left, I don't want to like get us stuck here longer than we need to. I mean, I guess let me just, let me actually ask you guys. Like, I don't want to write a ton of extra code here. How would you, without being too surgical and invasive, how would you make it so the app would go and load up those extra words if there are any when it launches itself? It isn't even really an Android-y kind of question. I think it's just a general coding question, right? I can show you the code that reads the dictionary file. Looks like this. What do you think? Can you repeat the question? Sure. The question is, when the app loads up initially, I want it to read in and, and load into the data sets um, not only the GRE words.txt original data, but I also want to load the extra words data if you have added any additional words. Right now it doesn't do that. It only loads from r.raw.gre words here. Any ideas? Yeah? Um, so could you make 
you were talking about taking the parameter of like a file name and then call it what you already entered. Yeah, so this code almost entirely is reusable. It reads lines, it splits them by tabs and stuff, right? The only part that's not reusable is that it always reads from the same place. And I might want to read from here and also read from the extra words file. So I think what you would probably do is you'd make this, as I think you said, make it take a reader that's a scanner or something like that. We're using a scanner object. or You could be a buffered reader. Whatever you want is fine. But up here, uh, when I'm loading up the app, maybe I'd say, hey, make the scanner and then use that. And then maybe I would do something like val reader2 equals a scanner that reads from open file input from extra words.txt. And then I'd say read the dictionary file from reader2. So just like call it twice with different scanners. Uh, if it's confusing to you why the syntax looks a little different, it's because one of the files is packed inside the app binary and the other one's a file we created. But like that pretty much solves the issue with reading in the extra words. Yeah. I was thinking of an alternative solution. Like, can you have two variable names with like one variable co containing the name of GRE words and second variable extra words, and then you call that in the scanner in the like reading thing? You could pass the string for the file name, and you could use that. Sure. There's definitely more than one way to do it. I just wanted to point out that like, there's not a lot left to patch up before this basically works. So, uh, you guys are going to go to your section today and tomorrow. I want you to practice there. We're going to have a kind of a little basic app about, about learning about different books and authors. And you'll click on an author and it'll show their book. And so I'm going to have you guys practice using these intents there. So that's all for today. And I'll see you guys on Thursday. Thanks.